Hello scientists, we are going to look at the top scientific paper of all time. This is not a paper that was written by any of the Nobel Prize winners. It is actually a paper about a protein measuring essay, the Lori essay. If you have ever worked with protein research, then you probably have used this essay. It will turn your protein solution into a very beautiful blue color. The original paper of its methodology has over 300,000 citations and a newsletter published by Nature in 2014 have ranked this paper as the most cited paper of all time. Even though this is a list from 2014, most likely this paper still holds its place as the champion because uh, for the past few decades, it has always been the number one. You might wonder why this is the case. And uh, to understand this, we need to take a look at what a citation is and what does it mean to have a lot of it. A citation is created whenever an author reference part of their new paper to an existing publication with the existing theory, discovery, or methodology. The purpose of this process is to guarantee that the new argument that you're building in your paper is based on facts. Because science is, I'm going to read this from my reference, the knowledge about the structure and behavior of the nature and physical world based on facts that you can prove, for example, by experiments. Here I cite the Oxford's Advanced Learner's Dictionary. So you know this definition is based on a credible reference. I did not make this up. Now we can see that the number of citations indicates how many new published papers are connected to the content of an existing paper. The higher the number, the more influential this uh, paper is. That is probably why the Nature Newsletter used the number of citations as the metric to rank the top 100 papers. 80% of humanity's papers are not cited once. So... Of course, there's limitations in using this uh, citation number to rank papers. We'll get into that at the end of this video. And before that, let's take a look at what the top paper is about. Let me grab the paper from this screen and move it over here so I can read it for you. The title of the paper is Protein Measurement with the Folene Phenome Reagent. Laurie is literally the first author of this paper. He and his colleagues published this method in 1951. And seven decades later, scientists across the world are still using this method to measure proteins. There are many Indian scientists who have uploaded their demonstration of this essay onto YouTube. So uh, go check them out, give them some support. You can see in their videos that this essay creates a very vibrant blue color. And the bluer the solution, the more protein there is. The blue color comes from the following circle 2 reagent reacting with the protein copper complex. Let's take a look at the experimental section section of the paper, you can find there are two steps which lead to the final coloring of the protein solution. In the first step, the copper ions bind to the protein and form the protein copper complex. These complexes have the oxidation property that can reduce the folding silk 2 reagent, which will change the color of the reagent from yellow to blue. The bluer the color, the more protein complex there is. So by measuring the optic density of the blue, we can determine the quantity of the protein. On page 271 of the paper, you can find this hand-drawn chart that shows 755 nanometer is the epoch wavelength of the optic density. 30 minutes of incubation time can produce a higher optic density than that of three minutes. So uh, now the standard protocol asks you to wait for 30 minutes before you measure the optic densities in spectral photometers. This figure is clearly hand-drawn and it's quite funny to see that back in the day, scientists need to draw these figures on pens with papers. Thank God we have Excel now. However, you guys still need to draw schematic uh, figures for explaining your signaling pathway or something beyond that like graphical abstract. Make sure you subscribe to my channel, then you will see all these uh, tutorials that can help you to draw like the style in those high impact journals. The rest of the paper tested more factors that can influence the assay such as pH, copper concentration, and different proteins from various tissues of rabbits. If you want to check out the details, you can find the paper in the link in the description. It is an open access paper, thank God. So it's free. Did publishing the most cited paper help the scientists in any way? 
Not that much, actually. None of the authors won the Nobel Prize, and Lori is the only one that is remembered for developing this essay. Lori did have a good academic career. He became the dean of Washington University's School of Medicine. But the reason of him getting this position is more owing to his entire body of work in the quantitative histochemistry. Actually, he wasn't even going to publish the Lori essay in the first place because he thought this essay is quite trivial. So he just、uh, passed it around internally between his colleagues. It was until one Nobel Prize winner, Earl Sutherland, complained that he is tired of referring this essay as the unpublished essay by Lori. Then Lori finally designed a thorough experiment to study the detailed properties of this essay and、uh, finally put it down into manuscript. His first manuscript was returned by the reviewers because it was too long. And af after some heavy editing, they finally published the shorter version. Version of the paper. You can find the backstory of this paper on the journal's website. The link is in the description. You see, from Laurie's story, it doesn't really help your academic career by having a highly cited paper. There are only two Nobel prizes that's、uh, awarded to the paper in the top 100 list. Let's take a look at who they are. The number four paper, which described the DNA sequencing method. And the other one is number sixty-three, which is about the PCR procedures. Oh, this one become really impactful because of COVID. Everybody knows what a PCR is now. It can even become a controversial topic. So, who benefits from the highly cited papers? The journals. By having these highly cited papers published in their journals, they can increase their impact factor. The impact factor is an index that is used as a proxy to measure the prestige of academic journals. It is calculated by the yearly mean number of citations of articles published. In the last two years, in a given journal, Nature has an impact factor of forty nine point nine six in twenty twenty. That means, on average, a Nature paper gets about fifty citations per year. You see why journals would fight for highly cited papers. Welcome to the Hunger Game of academic science. Now, let's do a little bit of role play. You are a paper hunter, and、uh, who should you recruit to maximize the prestige of your paper? The answer would be biotech researchers. Biology lab techniques dominate the top 100 list. They comprise 39% of the papers. These are the scientists the headhunters should focus on. You can check out Simon Clark's video about the top 100 papers of all time. He explained the list very well. If you are a biotech scientist, congratulations! Your paper has a high chance of becoming highly cited. Will you get something in return? Maybe you'll get a three-page acknowledgement from the journals, like what Lori got. But instead of profits and honors, your paper will help thousands of scientists around the world to move science forward, and we appreciate that.